three years ago when the borders were open, I remember traveling across Southeast Asia to work with clients on their digital banking strategy during my consulting days. To solve one of our region's greatest challenges, the lack of financial inclusion and financial access. We devised strategies and thought about the best products and channels for those who were not well served by traditional financial systems. These are your peers living in rural villages where financial infrastructure has not been set in place or your mom and pop stores who do not own a checking account, or even gig workers, migrant workers, small-time entrepreneurs who face insurmountable challenges when applying for mortgages and personal loans. The region has one of the largest unbanked populations today. In 2019, more than 70% of the unbanked, more than 70% of the population remained banked, unbanked or underbanked. And today, that number is still over 50%. In another vein, innovation has tra traditionally flowed from the West to the East, and Southeast Asia and India has traditionally lagged behind global peers in the US or in China. Think about our largest social networks, e-commerce stores, bright healing companies. We have been importers rather than exporters of innovation. Now this will and has already changed with the advent of crypto, blockchain, and Web3 disrupting our traditional financial systems and how things work as we transact bank, lend, and invest. The Southeast Asia and India region will become a key exporter of web, crypto and Web3 innovation and will probably witness the most exciting developments. And here's why. One, there is no other region that has a demographic as youthful as ours. 65% of the population is aged below 40, and this is compared to 50 plus percent in the US and in other markets. And if we think about the key demographic for retail investors for crypto and Web3, these are our Gen Zs and millennials for age 20s to early 30s. In fact, 58% of crypto holders today are aged under 34. So our young, growing population lends very favorably towards why penetration has deepened more than most developed markets. Two, the adoption of crypto and blockchain has the most potential to leapfrog traditional finance or even more banking in the region as a new type of money, a new system for daily payments, and possibly a new form of monetary policy and central banking. The region is already ahead of the crypto adoption curve, outpacing many other regions in terms of adoption with countries like Vietnam, India, Philippines, and many more already at the top adopters of crypto globally. With glo growing online penetration and 80% of the region now online, this propels our shift towards crypto and Web3 even further. Furthermore, Asia-Pacific is already the region with the highest usage of digital payments by transaction volume at $300 billion per year in 2021. And this gap is expected to widen over time with the enablement of crypto payments as well as better infrastructure. Third, the region's affluence has grown tremendously, outpacing all other regions with crypto and DeFi being a key destination for the region's wealth as an increasingly popular asset class. Given growing disposable income levels at 6 to 8% per annum, compared to 4% in the US, as well as a rising middle class and a $2.3 billion increase in investable income, the investment potential from this region into crypto is unlike any other. Looking more broadly, the region also benefits from secular tailwinds related to market structure. One, compared to the US, the Southeast Asia and India region is relatively less crowded with clear winners and increasingly regionalized demand, such as localized exchanges and brokerages due to fiat crypto conversion, as well as on and off brand regulations. In fact, most of the regional champions have sizable user bases and have scaled up their proposition and exported to markets globally. Some of the biggest names in crypto today including Binance, Ethereum Foundation, Terra, Crypto.com, Polygon, XC Infinity, and many more actually have roots in this region. Two, given regulatory, geopolitical, and business uncertainties in other North Asian markets, such as bans on crypto trading or prohibitive tax regimes, this has facilitated a natural inflow towards Southeast Asia and India as a regional investment center for crypto, Web3, and DeFi especially for investors sitting outside of this region. Similarly, there's also been an inflow of top companies, such as mentioned before, in the space into the region. Third, and very importantly, 
traditional financial systems in this region still lack sophistication and, democrat and democratization of access to the ma masses, including opportunities for private investments, digital payments, lending, and more, which has turned investors towards crypto and DeFi. Most importantly, in emerging markets, currencies are the most susceptible towards depreciating against the dollar. As we have seen in Russia and Ukraine, even in countries that are as big as them, they have seen significant shifts over the past few weeks in, a, in this regard. Crypto and DeFi has become the main way and the most neutral, accessible way of preserving wealth and value for those in emerging markets in the region, such as Indonesia, India, Malaysia, Philippines, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and many more. Lastly, the crypto and Web3 economy is nothing without a strong supporting ecosystem. In this part of the world, while regulators remain cautious around the implications of blockchain applications, they have generally been supportive or tolerant compared to most other regions that we have seen, with many of them putting forth federal policies for crypto usage, payments and trading, as well as piloting central bank digital currencies, which also stands for CBDCs, such as with India's recent budget in 2022. The ecosystem also sees institutional interest from traditional finance or TradFi, including banks, insurers, as well as public sector uh, clients, who are now launching their own custodial and Web3 offerings, as well as the government launching regulatory sandboxes. Even educational institutes are playing a large role in developing this ecosystem, with tertiary institutes like NTU and NUS and many more having been invested in R&D for blockchain research since many years back. This has cultivated an attractive pool of well-skilled as well as low-cost engineering talents from the market such as Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore who are borrowing the ecosystem. Similarly, given the cost advantage of this region when it comes to electricity as well as other infrastructure, this is very favorable for even mining type applications as well. But by 2030, I believe that the future of finance will be decentralized, democratized, transparent, efficient and cashless and Southeast Asia and India will be at the center of it. Thank you.